What's up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of Yala. Ba, 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 ba. Where we talk about the hottest news with a touch of what, Terrence? Good old humor. Good old humor. Uh, and, 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 and I guess a bit more, a bit more. A touch of uh, honesty, yeah. Honesty. <laughs> honesty, raw, authentic honesty as well. Yeah, the truth that we have had to keep down for the past three years. Um, um, yeah. I guess, yeah, the cat's out of the bag. You know, I mm. think the last podcast and the last couple of days have been a bit of a whirlwind for, for us, like, right? Because, mm-hmm. mm. I mean, if, if you're just joining us for the first time ever, maybe you read one of the articles, but... Uh, we are finally like sharing the story of that mythical TV show that we made three years ago called She's a Terrorist and I Love Her um, with, with a lot of uh, great help from Tech in Asia and Rice Media who covered the story in detail mm. about how mm. we got screwed over by the network hook uh, which no longer exists because they liquidated mm. um, how there still was a shit ton of money and how we are showing the show on our YouTube channel on our own terms. Yeah. Yeah, and, and sort of trying to close a chapter on our own terms, like right, and not not yeah. waiting for the powers that be to to give us the tell us that oh, okay, now it's time to talk about it. Yeah, yeah. And, and also to to not let the story die, la. Um, mm. because like um, the the articles that covered it, they did go into detail about what happened, and it is something that uh, I think it's hopefully people can read it. They can take away something from it. If you're running your own business, if you're in the space or even if you've, you might be like, uh, susceptible to corporate BS, right? That gives you a lot of info. Yeah. But that, that means also that I think there'll be a lot of new listeners to this podcast. So yeah. welcome, welcome. Welcome. Welcome to the club. Yeah. Welcome, welcome to the to the, the best club there is in Singapore right now, which is the yeah. Yalabad community. Uh, you know, what do we do here on Yalabad actually for this new um, uh, we we basically talk about two topics every podcast in the current uh, in the local and sometimes international news uh, mm. and we always try to consider both sides even if it means us saying something controversial and of mm. course on top of all that we put a touch of what Terrence uh, as mentioned good old humor yeah, yeah, yeah. good old humor good yeah, old humor yeah, yeah. So so yeah, uh, and I mean we we will be sharing more excerpts and trailers from the show. Uh, mm. We've also started a subreddit thread, uh, like a mega AMA about this, the mm. whole liquidation process, what the status is of the show. The link is in the show notes. So if you have any questions at all, just put it down there. We will answer mm. it at some point, either on the podcast or on the AMA thread itself. Yeah, yeah, cool. So- I guess that was the plug already, right? Basically. And just watch the show, lah. Watch the show. Watch the show. It's on our They're YouTube on channel, YouTube, Ministry yeah. Ministry of Funny YouTube channel. Yeah, yeah. all all eight uh, episodes are out, and uh, just yeah, just hope you enjoy it. Yeah, but Sweet. yes. Uh, cool. what's the first big topic? You know that that we that we're gonna do that is a bit more contentious. That's why we chose mm. it. Mm. The the first big topic, uh, I mean, it is the the month of Ramadan now, right? Uh, a few epi- podcasts ago, we mm. talked about. The Geylang uh, Sarai uh, Bazaar and, and the crazy rents that the stalls were paying. But there's another bazaar that is in the news. It's the Ramadan Bazaar in Woodlands. Because over the past weekend, mm. 25th and 26th March, there was an issue of non-compliance uh, where there was a stall mm. selling pork um, in, mm. in the midst of a Ramadan Bazaar. So Marceling, um, mm. the, the Facebook page uh, of Marceling Constituency Office, they discovered it um, and they engaged with the operator and they have taken steps to ensure that the stall no longer sells pork. Um, and then they apologize for, for mm. the occurrence mm. and that they will do their utmost to provide as best a Ramadan experience as they can, which includes performances, um, mm. and halal or Muslim-owned and non-halal stalls to cater to all residents. So, but but why 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 was this topic so divisive, yeah. Terence? Isn't it pretty clear-cut? What is the Yalaba yeah. moment? Yeah, I mean, there are, from what I see on comments online, people are asking, uh, I mean, it is a, like a Pasam Alam, right? Uh, it's not a, necessarily a religious Pasam Alam per se. Mm. So if there is stuff that is non-halal that is being sold, 
in, in this uh, Pasamalam that is meant to be uh, frequented or attended by everyone of every race or religion, mm. why why is there a need to you know limit what can be sold based on certain religious beliefs? Because isn't Singapore, regardless of race, language or religion, right? Mm. So if this is for the community, by the community and all, why why do we need to uh, have these restrictions? Mm. I mean, okay, so full disclosure, neither Terrence nor I are Muslim, right? Yeah. Um, yes. So we are speaking on, just as the as a lay person trying to make sense of the news. La. So mm-hmm. as a lay person, uh, my understanding is that Ramadan is a term that is very closely associated to to something that is religious. La. Mm. Mm. Uh, right? And the of course, there's the fasting, but the Islam as a religion, it also means you can't eat pork, right? So if this mm. is a Ramadan festival, uh, I mean, I can sort of understand like, why. It's like, it's like if you're doing a... Uh wait a deeper value okay just deeper value is not say so this is say a Christmas market yeah. say a Christmas market right yeah mm. Christmas but what was the restriction Christmas you can eat anything you want. <laughs> I don't think you can do but, anything you want you yeah. can do anything you can eat anything you in want. fact in fact in fact alcohol is encouraged right I suppose yeah to keep exactly warm and everything <laughs> exactly so no so I, like, I, was I just, guess you can't you can't. You can't uh, listen to death metal music or whatever at a Christmas market. La. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, but that one is more like, it's almost defamatory or or, or seditious to a certain extent. Like you have all those blasphemy, blasphemous content and all, right? I was just thinking mm. like, for a Deepa Valley fair, but I also know Deepa mm. Valley is not really tied to religion. Mm. Uh, I think. So this is where my, my basic knowledge of uh, Hindu customs also. But I think... If a Deepavali fair sold meat, mm. Mm. sold beef, like you're saying. Ah, sold, sold beef, like sold beef. Uh. Yeah, correct. It, it would feel like, hey, really? You you have to? Like, why? Mm. Mm. You feel it's uh, insensitive. La. I mean, so I know on, on online people were saying, why don't you just change the name of the fair from the Ramadan Bazaar to just a mm. Pasamalam or the mm. Woodlands Bazaar? Mm. Mm. And then you can you can just sell whatever you want, lah. Um, mm. So so that's where like it was it was interesting about this because I know some people are like what you're saying also like pointing out that if it, it really is for all the people living there, why can't they just sell pork? Because mm. pork also caters to a certain uh, demographic, lah. Yeah, yeah, right. Uh, I think people are also asking, oh, if there are non-halal stores there, uh, why is it that? That then we would say the non halal store must adhere to not selling pork, la, you know. Mm. Um, but, but I think there's some clarifications that I've been seeing when people are saying just because you're non halal, um, it might just mean that you don't have the certificate, la, right? But it doesn't mean that you you necessarily must sell something that uh your target community doesn't really eat, la, right? Mm, mm, mm. Yeah, Wait, yeah. what do you so, mean? What do you mean by that? To, to, because getting the halal certificate apparently uh is not it's not cheap la. It's mm. also quite expensive to get. Uh the requirements of of you know having uh Muslim staff and and attend training and things like that they're not easy to get la. So just because you are not halal certified, uh doesn't mean that you and just because you are so called labeled non halal, uh doesn't mean you need to go to the extreme of of selling pork la, right which which Muslim people don't eat la, right mm. uh, they you don't have to cater to that the extreme one it, it could just mean that you don't you're not you're not particularly certified halal la, right um, because you do get but, a lot of places that are no pork no lot right yes but they're not halal yeah yeah and yeah. but they're not halal and I know from the Muslim friends that I have of course you also get a range of how how to, how how much they adhere to to certain beliefs la. Um mm. just like I have Hindu friends who eat beef, I also have mm. Muslim friends who are not as strict la, right? Mm. But mm. generally I think uh, at no pork, no lard places, you can have stuff like fish and all that. It's it's fine, like you can stuff even just just no pork, no lard is always like it's almost like the universal thing in Singapore. La. You know, the moment of pork, mm. right? It's yeah. is no go la. It's no go. Yeah, yeah. But I mean, would right. it could it have been possible to segment off a part of the bazaar like 
there's this like naughty corner where where <laughs> go there, <laughs> there are no pork, halal right? stores. You just go yeah. there, whack the pork, <laughs> and you. <go. laughs> it's like the smoking corner. You got a smoking box, and this one is the the pork the pork box. <laughs> <right>? <laughs> <laughs> Only if you sell pork, you, know, you must be in that segment. Would, it, would, uh, that, would that make make things uh, more palatable at a Ramadan bazaar? You think? Um, I mean, like, uh, I don't know, man, because I did see that uh, a Yahoo article did say that the other bazaar, also nearby, mm. which was a Sembawang West Bazaar Ramadan, they mm. did have a halal and non-halal section uh, okay. that actually okay. sold pork. Um, mm. And this was a, a, a user who told Yahoo Southeast Asia la, on Tuesday, 28 mm. March. So that mm. was just yesterday um, that uh, uh, the organizers, ADEX International, said, yeah, it is divided into two stretches, one selling halal food and other non-halal. But even then they didn't, non-halal doesn't mean that it sells pork. Yeah, yeah uh, that's right. And to, to also point out that she claimed that uh, uh, meat skewers in the non-halal section were selling pork. Right? There's no verification of that. Uh, okay, okay. Yeah, so so even then, but but it just feels like, it's basically, okay, so for Hindus, right, the moment there's beef, right, mm. I think that one tough. La. Like, even at a wedding, right, mm. at a Hindu wedding, I don't think I've ever been to a Hindu wedding where they serve beef. Mm, mm. Certain Hindu non, wedding, non-Hindu guests or anything. Like yeah, certain Hindu weddings when you go there is all vegetarian food. It is a bit of a downer, like you're like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> but just another Tuesday, just another Tuesday. Just with another Tuesday. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Then the ones that are like maybe the more common types are you have the vegetarian section and you also have mm. the non-vegetarian section, but I've never mm. seen beef there. And I can be uh, sure that if there's beef there, right? Wow, all the aunties will pull up their saris and all, and just come out from come out for blood, la, like vegetarian blood, mm, But but I mean, I, I'm not 100 percent sure. But mm. uh, in Hindu belief, that there, there is an element of the, it's the animal is sacred, la, Right, the, the cow is sacred. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's why uh, it's frowned upon to to eat beef, la, Right. Yes, correct. Would it? Would it? Is it the same for Islam as well? Who? I don't think so, right? Yeah, I. Yeah, I don't think sure. the. Yeah, I don't think the pig is held in the, with the same reverence as a sacred animal uh, in Islam, right? Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. So, there, so I mean, uh, would, would there be some differences there? You know, I only asking because, like, like for example, like the, like uh, me, me as a dog owner and all that, right? Generally, I'm, I'm I try to be very. Uh, aware and sensitive to you know people who are uh, you know uh, don't want to touch the dogs for whatever reasons are uh, religious or they're just scared of animals and all that mm. but uh, you know on the flip side at the same time I'm like uh, okay if my if I'm with my dog just in the vicinity of uh, another group of uh, another group of uh, say, say a group of Muslim people or anything like that the should I get out of there should I not even be in close by in the vicinity, or is it okay for me to just you know keep to my corner and and not not and not let the dog run around or anything like right? Mm. So so that's my thing. Like, is it insensitive for me to just sit nearby with my pet, knowing that uh yeah they they don't they're not allowed to to touch a dog like for example. Mm. Mm. So yeah. that's that's the question I have like. like like I think your your what you said about the Hindus and beef I I think it's quite clear. It's, it feels insensitive because. The it is it comes from a place of like they they treat the animal with a lot of respect like, right yeah but yeah. I'm not sure about about I the, mean, for, for, the for, pigs and all that yeah for pork um what I what I found is that it's it's apparently based on a a specific Quranic verse like, that that mm. points out that the flesh of swine is mm. forbidden because it can carry various diseases so mm. yeah so it's not out of reverence like, from from okay. what I understand. Um, okay. But I was also thinking like, you know, the, the thing about, because we have spoken about uh, dogs in the context of the um, uh, cafe where uh, it's it's a halal cafe, dogs. right? Yeah, yeah, the guide dogs, right? So yeah. I think it's one of those things that using the example of a, as a dog owner, would you or have you ever literally asked them, are you comfortable if I'm here with my dog? Uh yeah, especially yeah, yes, especially when entering uh, enclosed public spaces like lifts, mm. for example. Mm. If I see that you know, uh, or I think that's a there's a a Muslim uh, 
person in the lift as well. I will ask quite outright, lah, right? Mm. Anyway, in fact, I always try to ask quite outright, hey, are you comfortable with dogs? Because I don't say Muslim, any, it could be anybody, anybody mm. could be scared of a dog, lah, right? And yeah. to be in an enclosed space of a dog, um, yeah, there can be a, you know, there, there's this, you feel the you feel the dog's breath and you hear the dog and you see the dog drooling on the floor that it can be a very uh, unnerving experience for the person uh, who's not comfortable. Mm, yeah. So in those in those instances, I think it's an issue. So yeah, maybe in, in, in the case of a Ramadan bazaar, because it is a very as much as it is open air, it's a very tight space, like right? Mm. Uh, where everyone brushes each other, you you smell things in the air, you will smell you you really feel the aura of, of everybody around you and, and the stores, everything. So it can, as much as it's open air, it can feel like an enclosed space. And maybe that's why now as I'm talking, I'm, I'm starting to see, okay, maybe there is, there is a bigger issue with uh, pork being served alongside, uh, you know, alongside all these uh, halal stores, right? Mm-hmm. So, mm. so, so, on that note, right, you know, you mentioned that if the dog is there, it's panting. I think one issue is also the fact that if the stall is selling pork, right, that mm. means it's also cooking pork there. Mm. Right? Mm, that's right. Um, And I would imagine if you cook anything, there will be things that are put into the air, right? Yeah. yeah. Little, little yeah. micro molecules of pork. <laughs> <laughs> as you inhale so, your, as you inhale it's like a, it's like a, what do you call it? Uh, like a shot to your, to your nose like that. Right? Yeah. And, yeah. and I can see this only because I can imagine my mom or like mm. other aunties in my family, uh, if they know beef is being cooked, right? The first mm. thing they'll cover is their nose. Mm. It means because I think... Like when walking past Shake Shack, right? that kind of thing. No. Like, you have to cover your nose. <laughs> <laughs> Everywhere you see Shake Shack, oh. <laughs> you cover your nose and run, is it? <laughs> No, no, no. What, then vegetarians how? Uh? Like you're just walking around the whole day. No, I can imagine because if you can smell certain, like, like you know, pork, uh, when you're cooking pork, there is a, it's almost you can there's tell a, that, oh, pork is smell. being cooked. There's a smell, yes. right? Yes, there's a smell. So, yes. I mean, I was also curious why, you know, you hear the thing about 90% of your taste is smell. Um, mm. At first I was like, oh, fuck. Are you breathing in all the food on the plate? And all? No, but it's because when you chew, certain aromas are released into your nasal cavity. Mm. But that also means, I mean, I can imagine aromas, you got little bits of whatever you're eating floating up, lah, right? Mm. So if you're mm. cooking pork nearby, technically, uh, it's different from like pork sandwiches, which is all packed. You know, people chew in their little corner and all. I think yeah. whenever there's yeah. meat, right, then it becomes tricky lah, because uh, like my home... Like my my wife is Catholic, right? But even then, mm. uh, the she won't cook beef at home. Mm, mm, mm. Out, of, yeah. out of respect to you, lah. Yeah, yeah. Out of respect, or, or is it out of respect to you or your <laughs> insistence? Like, can we just fuck uh, you, lah? Okay, you know, don't try the <laughs> shit. I'm not an overbearing husband. Okay, I am not. <laughs> okay. <laughs> You know when you have to put out a defense like that <laughs> yeah. and put it I on that not, public yeah. record. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> to anyone listening, I'm not an overbearing husband, okay? I did uh, not yeah. have sexual relations with that woman. Uh, yeah. But yes. Um, <laughs> no, but it oh, is shout out, out of, to Bill Clinton. Yeah. Yeah. It is it is out of uh respect, like, which I appreciate. Uh, but at the at the same time, let's say when I'm vegetarian with you, right? I don't think I've ever asked you, hey Terrence, mm. can you not eat meat in front of me? You know, when you chew, right, all the aromas coming out of your mouth, I'm inhaling it. No, right. I haven't Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, you've been generally a bit more passive aggressive about it, lah. Like <laughs> yeah, uh, generally, you're like, uh, oh, you know, it's Tuesday, it's vegetarian, so hey, I really want to sit down and talk, there, You know, let's have like a good time, all sit down and talk together. Let's go go eat a vegetarian restaurant. <laughs> hey, not bad, right? The vegetarian food here is quite good, right? And I'm like, oh, yeah, hey, yeah, it's good. Please, lah. <laughs> I don't think we've ever gone to a fully vegetarian restaurant. Don't give me this nonsense. Yeah, we also- have, we have, yeah. <laughs> But but even then, I don't think I'm as militant as uh, no, uh yeah, yeah. as other people like. So I can I think it's because yeah, when you're cooking and all, it's just it's just a different different thing like. But mm-hmm. but then the bigger question is like even for, I would imagine it's general knowledge that Ramadan is tied to Islam, uh, and I yeah. would assume that most people know that in for Islam, pork is really forbidden like, You know. Mm-hmm. That's right. So then it comes to the question is like, oh, the organizers, like, what was the process of even organizing these stalls? Because I can imagine there are processes in place. 
Um, can mm. we expect them to look at every menu item on the stalls? I also don't think so, like, because the pictures, I mean, it looks like quite a big bazaar, like, right? Mm. But mm. it just feels like where where was the, the kink in the process here that allowed this mm. to happen? Because I still feel that they should there shouldn't be a stall selling pork at a Ramadan bazaar, like. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. As we talk through it, I, I'm starting to see that it, it is, it's not so easily to define a halal space and non-halal space at a bazaar as well, Yeah. Uh, but I mean, to your point, I mean, we've spoken about this in a as a topic, right? The, uh, basically, is it feels like a very free for all in terms of the rentals, like, right? Yeah. Like uh, that that basically whoever's organizing these bazaars has been able to charge uh, really, really high rentals for these things. And I wouldn't be surprised if, you know, uh, just speculating, but I wouldn't be surprised if it's, it just really goes to the highest bidder. La. And then mm. is there a re- very close examination of what is on their, every, on their menu? I don't necessarily think so. La, because, you know, there's so many other things that you need to to set in place before you uh, you sign off on, on some on on this person joining your bazaar, right? Mm. So, I don't, yeah, like, like what you think, I, I don't think that there's a, a chance to really examine everything on the menu and, and to say, okay, you can't do this. Probably if it's very blatantly like you're selling suckling pig or something, then, <laughs> then they, they probably have to stop you there, lah, right? But if it's like one or two items on the menu, maybe it just slips through the cracks, huh? Yeah. And I mean, the, the, the Facebook page themselves, the muscling uh, constituency, uh, mm-hmm. They did acknowledge someone who pointed out that the managing non-compliance is hard, lah, you know. There mm. are challenges. Um, Yeah, they do allow non-halal stalls there, you know. So, mm. as a non-halal stall, you can end up there. But if you mm. just happen to sell one pork product, then whose responsibility is it, lah, you know. Mm. Mm. Correct, yeah. correct. Oh, this, this world I'm of, curious, like, I'm curious, uh, like, exactly what the products were, so, lah. Did it, did it didn't say right specifically. Yeah, I, I haven't found anything that said that specifically. Yeah, uh, because it, like like what you said, if it's just the uh, let's say it's like uh noodles, some kind of noodles or something, but they use pork lard in the noodles to give make it more flavorful. Uh, is is that the same issue? It's not. It, it should be a different issue from like selling like uh you know uh, pulled pork or anything like that directly, like, Right. Hmm. True. True. But then, I, 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 I don't know. I would imagine that the item, it, it is visibly pork. Uh, mm. Because unlike the Sambawang one where it was just uh, like thinking or assuming it's pork. This one, yeah. So so you can imagine it is pork products. La. So then, mm. it, yeah, like, like what you say, it feels like this whole area of Singapore, suddenly in the news, there's so much news about bazaars. Uh. Um, <laughs> there was another news topic about a pony ride, right? Yes, yes, about, uh, I think uh, animal activists are, are saying that ponies shouldn't be used as entertainment at these bazaars, like, right? And uh, so it's, yes. uh, suddenly, suddenly bazaars have become like the hot, the hot topic in town. Yeah. Like everyone's debating about something in the bazaar. Yeah. Last time I thought bazaars, you come down from the MRT, you get one ota, maybe one sausage, you go, now wallah, we must navigate like inflation, mm. you know, some, some pork and a random pony here and there. Cultural oh, wars. Wow. Uh, it's like these bazaars have become the microcosm of all the problems we're facing in society already. Uh. Inflation, uh, you know, <laughs> the the pol- polarization, polarization of society, animal rights, everything. Uh. Religion, everything. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it's like it's like really a, a what's that? Petri dish. Uh, petri dish. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. To see what happens. Uh. But then, yeah. so if they call it a bazaar, just a pasta mm. malam, mm-hmm. would, that, would that work for you? And then uh, they carry on selling pork. Yeah, I was thinking of that, but then it's it's what in in what spirit is this pasar malam set up, like, Right, like when you go to the Chinese New Year, uh, then Chinatown, the the fair and everything. I mean, all the the street stores is specifically for Chinese to celebrate Chinese New Year, like, Right, there's mm. no other time in the year where there's this where all these stores decked out in red and everyone's eating all these snacks and celebrating. So. To, to try and mask it like, oh, it's meant to be, it's not meant to be a Chinese New Year thing, you know. It would be kind of uh, in, disingenuous, like, to say the least, uh, mm. just to be politically correct or something. So I would rather they just, yeah, they just stick to what, what it's called like as a Ramadan bazaar. Like. But what do you think? Like? Do you think it should be changed just to, from downgraded from just, to just a regular pasta malam? 
I mean, my initial thought that, hey, actually, that would solve it. But I think what you said is true. Like, you look at the pictures and I can imagine even the stalls there, if they knew they, knew they were going to be at a Ramadan Bazaar, mm-hmm. you can imagine like even their banners or something, it might be a little more festive, la, right? Yeah. And then if you just change it to a Pasar Malam, then, then you, then, it, yeah, it just feels like neither here nor there. So I guess they seems like they took the right step to get uh, to tell that vendor to stop as opposed to change it, changing the entire name. Because uh, even the mm. banners and posters they put up will need to change. Yeah, yeah, yeah entirely. All right. Yeah. So, so I mean, uh, I mean, I was surprised by how many, uh, how many outlets covered this. So, mm. feels like, yeah, this, this month, probably this is not going to be the last uh, bazaar related uh, article. Uh, yeah. I think, I think there's going to be more. Uh. Yeah. It's, <laughs> It's a bizarre world we live in, uh, when the bazaar is uh is the key focal point of all our cultural our cultural uh debates. Uh. Yeah. Maybe maybe I will go to Gelang Sarai. Uh. Get a feel. Yeah, get a feel, uh, get a feel. It's I not mean, too far from my people, house or so. Yeah, people are even debating about like the the cost of Ramli burgers at all these mm. bazaars uh, compared to what mm. they were before. So mm. I'm actually curious to go there and, and get a sense of like yeah, how much prices have really increased or so. Mm-hmm. yeah so maybe yeah, maybe I think we still got about two more weeks yeah 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 but two yeah two more so, weeks you know speaking of like trying to isolate certain areas from uh from unwelcome influences like right mm. uh, it's not just happening in our Gelang Sarai Bazaar or bazaars in Singapore it's happening mm. in across the other side of the world as well like, right and yeah. What? But what is this specific instance? <laughs> it is uh, the fact that Amsterdam, this past Tuesday on March 28, they have launched a campaign to discourage tourists planning drug and alcohol parties. Yeah. And their first demographic is going to be young British men uh, from the age of 18 <laughs> to 35. So, so what apparently will happen, uh, I mean, the campaign is called Stay Away. And if, um, if you happen to search for certain getaways in Amsterdam, you will receive hmm. a warning. It means like uh, Google, will, Google ad in Google, on Google search, right? Yeah. It's a yeah. discouragement campaign. Yeah. So, it might be expanded to potential nuisance causing visitors from the Netherlands and other EU countries. Yeah. So, so if you search Stag Party Amsterdam or Pub Crawl <laughs> Amsterdam, you will be shown warning advertisements. Yeah. yeah. So, Terence, what do you think of this? Uh? What would cross your mind if, like, let's say you're really planning a stack party in Amsterdam, you Google it and you see this ad saying, Terence, hi there. Um, the, uh, please be aware that any stack party you organize should not entail any alcohol or drugs. Uh, perhaps you could consider having a cup of tea or a brownie that has no cannabis yeah. in it. Yeah, I, I think... What would you say? I, I would be even more excited to go. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I will round up ten more friends than what I originally intended, and hey, this this is going to be yeah. the most epic night ever. Yeah. Not only are we going to drink, go do drugs, but we're going to break some yeah, rules yeah, and potentially get criminal records and everything. But but the funny thing was like, yeah, I I saw they even did a a video about it. A very uh, the city of Amsterdam literally did a video where they showed like a clip of uh, uh people being arrested. You know, and and you know, being hauled away from the from the the red light district lah, and then with text, you know, and finally ending with stay away. You know, if not, you you will get a criminal record. You'll be fined. I think one hundred forty euros or something like that, and and mm. uh, all these warnings lah. So it looks like just a very badly produced uh crime watch crime watch snippet lah. You know, so I was just like, my goodness, is they. It might have a little bit of that whole Streisand effect thing. Like you don't want people to come, but now that you, you're doing this and putting this campaign out there, I think people will be more interested to go and, and like, like really test them, push the boundaries of what they can do. Yeah, but then but then if you think mm-hmm. about it, right, because apparently in Amsterdam, there is a, a growing initiative to boost uh, their tourist mm-hmm. image, tourism mm-hmm. image, to reduce rowdy mm-hmm. behavior and improve livability and safety. Yeah. Uh, and apparently officials have also announced, you know, new policies to limit tourism growth and nuisance, mm-hmm. combat overcrowding. Um, and I can imagine these measures, these initiatives, um, 
they are yeah they are going to be limiting number of cruises uh, earlier closing times for bars mm. car clubs and windows brothel so we i don't really know what sort of um, advertisements of discouragement will be shown to searchers of mm. those terms but maybe it is just notices that okay the clubs will will close early lah and Certain parts of the city, you can't smoke cannabis mm. anymore. I think in the specifically and the it's, it's the red good. light district. Yeah. I think you can't walk around the streets and and smoke mm. cannabis anymore. And there, I think there are some discussions about potentially moving everyone in the red light district to something called an erotic center, where oh yeah, correct. where all the erotic activity is centered in one location, uh, because they say that that could help reduce, uh, you know, street crime, uh, reduce the influence of uh, gangs and everything in the in the red light district, lah. Yeah, I mean, it's one of those things that uh, rather than ban it, you yeah, regulate yeah, yeah, it, lah, right? Um, it would be like 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 Funan is in Singapore. You know, yes. Funan used to be for yeah, IT yeah, products. Yeah. Then when you go, eh, hey, hey, bro, I meet you at the erotic. But I think center. I, was, I thought it would be more like center, speakers' yeah. corner, lah, right? You know where where like they want to people want to go and protest and everything. Oh, can can you come you come to speakers corner? We give you the place to do it, but you gotta apply for a police permit first, lah, and things like that, lah. No, but but that's the thing, right? I think uh, that's that industry. It's not as criminal mm. in Amsterdam as it is in yeah. other countries. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um. And I mean, the the more we talk about it, the more I can actually I can I can see why they're doing mm. this, lah. And I don't know how they could have done it better because growing up, right. Every time I hear people going yeah. Amsterdam, there's only certain images that come what, into mind. Windmills and, and Dutch ladies and yeah. and cheese, yeah, <laughs> windmills and cheese. <laughs> yeah, Gouda, some Gouda cheese. No, it is like smoking up, getting hammered, yeah. um, and just just letting go and mm. going wild. So can you imagine if that is what if you're living there? That's what people come to to Amsterdam mm. thinking, lah. Because you know, like. Even now in Singapore, when tourists come to Singapore, and I don't know, there are certain behaviors where it feels like they can do whatever they want. And that annoys me, mm, la, right? Mm, that's uh, true. Uh, and that might just be me being an uh, a douche, but I think I can. I can't imagine. I've never been to mm. Amsterdam. I've heard stories from friends who have been to yeah. Amsterdam, and it just feels like all hell breaks mm. loose, la. But some people are saying that, isn't it? Um, isn't it kind of hypocritical? In the sense that you know that mm. the tourists, a lot of tourists, are coming here because of how liberal the you know the country and the city is with drugs and and uh, sex sex workers and everything, like, Right. So you want mm. these people to come, but you rather than let them do what they want to do, you want you want them to be going to cafes, hanging out in museums, uh, you know, exploring other kinds of cultural uh, culture and stuff, like. So isn't that it's kind of hypocritical. Like you want the tourists, but you don't want the the tourists that come because of because of your reputation and all that, right? But but that's the thing, right? It feels like they actually want to change the image of Amsterdam mm, mm, mm. to be not as sleazy as it used to be. So maybe it is it is a pro and con, line, you know? We will have to put out this mm. campaign which might cause a spike in short-term yeah. tourists who want to come and like, let's fuck yeah. this shit up. But, but yeah, it's part of the broader plan to turn Amsterdam yeah, into I don't disagree with a plan. something more yeah, wholesome. I don't disagree with the plan, but it seems like this campaign uh. seems to place the blame on the tourists coming. Like, Stay away. Like, you know, like, like yeah. they <laughs> almost like they're, they're like locusts, like that, like, you know, where they can't control, can't, can't control these tourists coming in and all that. Like. Whereas like, <laughs> it's like, you're just a tourist. You just want to have a good time. You just want to visit your friends. Maybe you will go to a museum during the day, but at night you will you will just let go, lah. You know, so so it just it just seems very uh like like you're speaking, all, you're all high and mighty. Like stay away from our country if you're not here to engage in our culture. You know, outside of the red light district. Mm. That's why I think it's it's rubbing people the wrong way as well, lah. Yeah, mm. yeah, yeah. Because if you're like if you're like a twenty five year old Brit male <laughs> who has never drunk or smoked yeah. in their life. Really wants to go visit this one <laughs> library in Amsterdam, right? And then you're bad. You come, people will be like, you fucking stay away. <laughs> yeah. Understand? You stay yeah. away. <laughs> yeah, you could be. Yeah, you could be the most quiet, quiet person in the world. Then the more just because you're you British in a certain age group, suddenly there's this ad fed to you. Stay away. Isn't it like? Stay yeah, away. it so feels very unfriendly. Yeah. Mm. 
Yeah, maybe the stack party you're planning is really to go on a cheese tour, yeah. you know, and visit the exactly. windmills. Exactly. But then, but then, okay, so like Singapore probably has done similar campaigns in the past also, um, right? I guess like uh, the, that, the, the, uh, the big thing I can think of is our drug warnings, right? Like every time before you land on a, on a mm. you take a flight out and then you come back to Singapore. On the way in, there's all these announcements that, you know, Singapore takes its drug trafficking laws very seriously and you will face penalties of even up to death and everything. So that's a very big deterrent already, right? And we're very well known for our drug policy and all, right? Mm-mm-mm. So, yeah, I, I guess I guess maybe the way they do this, like, because I don't know whether it was a press release that was announced or something, but a lot of articles are mm. covering it. And... You can you can still technically show the the warnings generally to anyone who is um okay like you wouldn't want anyone searching Amsterdam to see like warnings like please don't do drugs <laughs> because in in Singapore you know when you hear that on the plane it's like it's a bit of like I know that's yeah. the goal to unsettle yeah, yeah. people but it is a bit of a downer chilling, like, a right? chilling effect like, right <laughs> it's very chilling you're like oh my god I'm coming to Singapore wait what uh okay Ken. Uh okay, just a reminder that don't don't fuck up with drugs because you might get killed, you might get mm. hung. La. So for this one, they can't do anyone searching uh flights to Amsterdam to be with this whole uh, naggy list of things not yeah. to do. But has Singapore ever put down some sort of restrictions that curbs the general tourists? No, right? I think drugs are very yeah. strict. Yeah. But I think it's always the case that that you we want to be inviting people. Yeah, we we'll always invite la. tourists. But I think we have a lot of uh, marketing on the ground to remind people not to misbehave. La. Remember the Singapore Police Force got all this don't molest, don't molest, don't do not do it, you know, like uh, kind of posters around showing a guy about to touch some girl's butt and then there's a handcuff around his hand. Oh, yeah. yeah. So there's a lot of uh, yeah. trying to shape people's behavior after they've entered Singapore. La. But not before they come to Singapore that we, oh, we don't want people like you here, you know, and then... And then after that, uh, we just tell them, please don't come. Which is kind of, Can you yeah, imagine? it's kind of strange. Uh, yeah. Can you imagine if you Google, where to eat Mipok in Singapore? <laughs> then a uh, big ad, don't molest, don't molest. people. <laughs> don't molest. Yeah, you eat your Mipok, you fuck yeah, off. Yeah. Don't, don't molest. molest, okay? Yeah. It's a don't molest. Don't molest. Uh, what, what other like, like um, kind of social behavior modifying campaigns do we do? There's the the shop theft, shop la, you know, theft. the yeah. don't, don't yeah, steal. Don't steal, correct, correct. Yeah. Shop theft. Don't litter. Don't litter. Don't, litter. don't spit. Mm, don't spit. Uh, don't bring durian into MRTs. Mm, mm. There are, then there, there are signs uh, reminding people to be, to observe quiet hours or so, la, right? Mm, 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 things mm. like that. Uh, yeah. So, so, I mean, this one, they are going to target geo, ge- uh, geographically. La. Like, in Singapore, you search those terms, I don't think you will <laughs> see it but I mean like I okay so just extrapolating from what you've heard about uh, English football fans mm-hmm. right um, who like I've heard they can be super mm-hmm. rowdy la, right mm-hmm. I don't know whether in Singapore we have seen the extent to how rowdy foreigners uh, foreign tourists can mm-hmm. get but maybe this one really is next level la. I don't know what the history is in terms of offenses that people have committed mm. when in Amsterdam for one of these tech trips. But, I don't know, looking at pictures of some of my friends who go to Bali for a tech trip and the state they leave the Airbnb in, I'm like, oh my God. <laughs> what the fuck did you all do yeah, there? Yeah. Maybe it's, uh, yeah, lah, like, like it's specifically rather than, you know, discourage people from having stack parties in Amsterdam. They need to offer alternatives though. Like what you say, maybe they, there needs to be more like wine tasting or cheese tasting kind of like uh sessions la, that they organize that 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 people on stack parties can go to together, you know, as a group of friends and everything. That they don't feel like it's a mm. very it's a very watered down experience. So so to me it's like you offer some rather than, mm. than tell people not to do the bad thing, you gotta offer some positive things as an alternative la, for them to do. Uh, that's a very that's a, like a one on one of uh of parenting these days, like You know, don't tell the kid, don't, no, you cannot do this. But you offer them alternative. Uh, yes, but let's try this, you know, or let's try this on this other thing instead, lah. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Or maybe it's a brilliant marketing tactic. <laughs> to get more people to maybe come. Maybe they want more tourists to come. <laughs> oh, and it's, they just and make they it so cheesy. And they understand human psycho. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that we will talk about it. We say, don't. Yeah. yeah, it's like, you know, don't come yeah. here and go crazy. <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't be naughty. Yeah, only cost the cost <laughs> of you being naughty is only 140 euros, nothing more, you know. Yeah. yeah not a big you know, deal. You don't want to lose 140 euros. Yeah. It's kind of funny. Because uh, I mean, even on Reddit, people are sharing uh, comments about, yeah, like you get some people from Amsterdam saying that it is a problem. Some people say that, like what you said, like, you know, Amsterdam for a long, for a long time has profited from it being like mm. this, this, this city where people go to let loose. Yeah. But it's just, I'm just surprised that Amsterdam announced a campaign like this. Yeah. This feels like it could come from Singapore. Yeah. So Singapore is like passion, right. passion made possible. Uh, passion made possible. Yeah, passion, yeah. Passion but then you add possible. on, but stay away from Geylang, you know. <laughs> <laughs> stay away. Yeah. You stay away. Funny. Oh man. Funny, yeah. 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 Well, that's a second yeah, state so, of affairs. In Amsterdam right now. It does make me want to go to Amsterdam more. I'm not going to lie. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, absolutely. I, I, I do. In fact, to me nowadays, there's a... I realize like, especially with COVID and all, like, you realize like a lot of things that you think, oh, one day I'll go and visit this place and all that and do this and that. You, it, it could be, you know, it could be... It might not be there the next time you plan to go already, you know? So, so mm. for all you know, like this mm. red light district in Amsterdam, it, it could really move to erotic center next time already, lah. And then what you get is is closer. It's a very very watered down experience of whatever it is now, like, You know, yeah. And I'm not I'm not advocating yeah, people yeah, exactly. going to red light districts. I'm just saying, even just walking around and just understanding the atmosphere of the place, like you might not be able to to feel it next time, like, Yeah. So even my mom has gone for a <laughs> tour of the red light district in Amsterdam. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Even my mom with her siblings all in their 60s walking around. <laughs> <laughs> Those are the people. Then they, then they got They're a like, sign. Stay away. Stay away, mums. Stay, Stay away, away. grandmums. Yeah. Stay away. Yeah. Funny. But I mean, yeah, like, like it is something that I would like to also just see because Amsterdam, the fact that, you know, there's debates uh, in government about an erotic center. Mm. Oh, allow it. It just feels like it's an interesting country, like interesting yeah. city. Yeah, it is. Interesting city, not country. Yeah, yeah. But anyone with uh, experience, mm. yeah, but, anyone with experience of being in Amsterdam and, and experiencing the red light district for what it is, yeah, do let us know. Tell us, let us know what you think about all these new measures and whether whether it's really a problem that needs to be tackled in such a strange way. La. Yeah. Yeah, man. But yeah. So we uh but cool. Speaking of uh yeah, you know, uh <clears throat> letting us know your experience. I mean I think the last couple of days we've been getting a lot of a lot of good feedback about uh everything that we've been talking about with She's a Terrorist and I Love Her. So what is your mm. one shot comment the last couple of days? Um I mean the one shot comment, maybe this is just uh collectively for even people who uh I mean on Yalabad there have been a lot of encouraging messages, the Reddit, but uh in our DMs, in our personal messages and even on the Posts of Rice Media and all, we generally see quite a lot of people saying, oh, you know, is there a GoFundMe page or uh, can we support in any way? Which really means a lot to us. I mean, thankfully, we we have moved on, mm. you know. Uh, we have wonderful things like this podcast. But just but just seeing that sort of response uh, really means a lot because it makes us feel like, okay, sharing this story was worth it. Lah, because it wasn't a clear-cut decision for Terrence and I to actually do this. Mm. Um, but yeah, so just very heartened by the responses so far. Yeah. Yeah. Uh same for me. Yeah. I think uh we're getting a lot of responses. Um and then even like one of the comments from our last podcast was uh was from, you know, a, a listener Rai Kotala saying, Thank you so much for sharing and I'm quite shocked and angry about the amount owed to you guys. Uh and it's really not fair having to take a personal loan to the end being paid in sight. And you know, Rai Kota goes on to say, You guys are really strong, are really strong and you know it's it's amazing. It's great that you managed to stay around and create even more things. And Yalabad is one of my favorite things. I could never do the same. So as Harish always mm. says, kudos, man. But yeah, so, you know, I, I think uh, if you're listening to this, uh, we, we always have emphasized to people that one of the, the, the positives out of everything that happened in 2020 and COVID and all was like this podcast, like, this podcast and this community that we've managed to build and, and, 
and really rally around us in, in you know, in, when when these kind of things happen. And and you know, I think uh, I, I've I've spoken about it before. Like even in the 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 darkest times of my life as well, I've I've felt like hey, you no, know, there's something good about you know just talking about things, talking you know to to you guys as a community and the community. You guys also reaching out in private DMs to to offer support and things like that as well. It's just been pretty amazing, uh. So mm-hmm. so that's that's what I would really shout out to all the yellow butt listeners as as a, my one short comment, uh. Yeah. Yeah, and I mean, like, just, like we, like I mentioned, we also will, we do have that subreddit, just like a mega AMA. Mm-hmm. Um, if there's anything you want to ask about or know about, please just fire away. Because one big thing for us about sharing the story is also that, uh, yeah, just just getting it out there to let whoever uh in positions of power or decision making, hot seats, to know that you do this kind of stuff there will be impact mm. and people like I hope it also makes people who are going through similar shit or have gone through shit to know that with the internet right anyone can can really have a voice and that sense of hopelessness that you might feel uh, yeah there, there's, there, there there might be a way to just get it out there you know it's it's cathartic but it also lets other people know of things to look mm. out for when you're doing similar stuff yeah 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 so so uh thanks for all the comments so mm. far mm. cool okay then now now one for the for the one shock thing of yes. the week of the past few days uh yeah, yeah for me um i think my one shock thing is actually kind of related to a hot topic the last few days like, right uh it's it's just reading people's um responses about Responses to the TikTok CEO's uh, testimony in front of Congress. Uh, seeing how people are writing about it on LinkedIn. Uh, and I'm sure if you went on your LinkedIn and you just searched for TikTok CEO or that, you probably see a lot of these. you see a lot of articles or blog posts from thought leaders on LinkedIn. Uh, the, the, and, and the amazing things that I'm seeing them comparing uh, the TikTok CEO to Nelson Mandela. I'm seeing them comparing comparing him to to Martin Luther King. Uh you know, very proud that this Singaporean has stood up into the face of of oppression and 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 you know uh, the the idiocy of of the US Congress lah, right? And uh I'm just laughing because there's at the same time, you know, there are people posting these things. Then there are also people in the comments basically shooting them down and saying like Oh my God! Did you just compare the TikTok CEO who, who earns, <laughs> no. who, who has bought a GCB worth eighty six million in Singapore, and is paid handsomely to do his job? Have you just compared him to like Nelson Mandela, and then just because, just because of uh one experience of watching him on on the on screen? What? So it just really yeah oh, fuck you know I I thought the last time we talked about it that was like okay that's where it would die but but I I don't know you've probably been seeing it like, a lot of posts a lot of people have been lionizing him as like this amazing uh leader who stood up to oppression and everything um yeah, I mean it's just been fascinating to watch and and funny also to 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 read when people uh you know are trying to be thought leaders and and doing such posting such strange things like yeah. Uh, it's just funny, like, yeah. I mean, I've seen, I've seen people like get smitten over him and all that, like, which, yeah, okay, that's fine. Okay. I think that's but okay. But to yeah. compare, yeah, because the other day also I heard someone say that they feel sorry for him, and I'm like, no, 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 no. <laughs> no. Okay, why, why, why you feel sorry, uh, yeah. for for him? You know, like, I mean, as the CEO of a of a, one of the biggest tech companies in the world, that's. It's not an enviable position to be grilled like that, but uh, yeah, no, yeah. no feeling sorry for him. Yeah, no feeling sorry. No feeling sorry. No feeling for sorry, him. and no need to lionize yeah. him like he's freaking Nelson Mandela's equal or anything like that, la. I mean, I was, I yeah. just so I. So that's your shock it's thing. It's my is shock it? thing because I, <laughs> it, it, I really can't believe that people are, are talking like this on LinkedIn, and and you know. Maybe maybe the closer thing is just to talk in general about LinkedIn culture, like, right? How people, thought leaders, are you know constantly putting their thoughts out without really filtering what and thinking critically for themselves, like, about whether what they're posting is true or not, like. So maybe that maybe that's mm. a, 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 the shock thing in itself, like, the LinkedIn lunatics, like, yeah. 
<laughs> oh, oh my god like I'm just looking there's one post 18 hours ago of someone who met up with her two friends and is a new word mm. of the day it's show and they said our catch up was show good oh my and she god. said yeah the three of them have a tiny professional crush on show chu <sighs> uh talking and giggling like high school girls over him and the endless flood of videos oh my god yeah. his charisma is eq and communication skills are show good what yeah, it's, it's a bit strange wow. really, really. Wow, interesting. interesting. But yes, what is your one show? Uh, okay, so my one show thing is a podcast I listened. Uh, I mean, it's one of my favorite podcasts. It's called How I Built This. It's an NPR podcast. Mm-hmm. And they interviewed Sam Altman, who's one of the co-founders of OpenAI. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, it was interesting because he is kind of like Mark Zuckerberg in the way he talks, but feels like he has a lot more or he displays a lot more empathy and emotion. Mm-hmm. La. But Generally, his journey was he had his own startup 2009. 2012, he noticed that, okay, there's something happening in AI. 2015, he started um, OpenAI to 2014 or 2015. And uh, this was recorded, I think, last year before ChatGPT blew up into the mainstream. Mm. But certain things he said, which were nice, but also quite chilling in a way. Uh, One example I remember he said was that when they thought about, okay, if AI reaches the level they predict, the first jobs that would go would be the menial jobs, followed by the blue collar jobs, and then this, and the last would be creatives. Like. And he said, now they've seen the reverse, which no one expected. Like the jobs that are being threatened the most um, are, are like yeah. the creative jobs. Like. And he said, that's that's an example of how you can plan for everything, but the way it turns out mm. is uh, it's totally different. Like. And then the last part, mm. the guy asked him that, yep. uh, there's yep. this person, Robert Oppenheimer, yep. who I think worked on the Manhattan Project, which which developed, you know, the first mm-hmm. nuclear war, uh, yeah. nuclear bomb, who apparently later in his life said that um, he regrets being part of that project like, or, or something along those lines. And Guy asked Sam Altman, you know, can you promise me that AI won't go down that path? And what Sam Altman said was quite interesting. Like, he said he has Robert, Robert Oppenheimer's mm-hmm. book on his table every day. He looks at it um, and he said, you know what, I can't promise you that mm-hmm. it will go all good. I promise you I'll do my best to prevent it. So, mm. listening to the podcast, he's obviously a genius, but it's inspiring, it's optimistic, but also chilling to a certain extent. Yeah, so listening to it, you're like, oh my God. Uh, because, I mean, he did say that, you know, this is going to be bigger than even the internet revolution, the digital revolution, the industrial revolution, or this is going to be yeah. the equivalent of our generation. So, he was interesting, man, but 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 chilling also. Mm-hmm. Yeah. More AI. More AI discussions. More yeah. AI discussions. Yeah. Nice. But uh yeah, man. That's that's all we have today. How how long is the whole podcast? Like how long is one that hour, podcast? twenty minutes, I think. Oh, okay. Yeah, okay. Okay, so Robert Oppenheimer did work on the Manhattan Project. Um yeah. there's a Christopher Nolan's doing a movie about Oppenheimer. Oh, is it? Uh, it's coming out. Yeah. It's about the life and story of uh, Oppenheimer. Yeah. yeah. But but yeah. Um, so yeah, that, cool. that's all for today. Thanks for listening, everybody. All right, thanks. And do check out She's a Terrorist on our YouTube channel. Yeah. yeah.